Ladies and gentlemen, Caravan fans, welcome back to the historic alumni gym here at Mount Carmel High School. My name is Matt Malloy, senior, with my good buddy and fellow senior, Christos Dimas. Christos, how you doing? Doing great, Matt. Uh, first snow of the year tonight. Uh, feeling a little bit in that Christmas uh, season, but not yet, because we got to get through the IHSA football playoffs first. Definitely. Um, and then we'll go on to Christmas. But uh, feeling really excited for this long-awaited matchup, this rematch from two years ago yeah and you know what they say i mean the colder the weather gets the harder the competition gets as we move forward and forward into november these teams we play are going to be more competitive they're going to have harder defenses to play against we've seen these guys though right unlike the first three teams we've played in the playoffs uh rita is a little bit different this is the 105th game all time between these two teams one of those games came earlier in the regular season. To start off in the second week, we beat them 28 to nothing. The first and only shutout of the 2024 season. Christos, it's going to be a good one. It's away at St. Rita, but we figured we'd still might as well do a pregame show here because of the magnitude behind this game, right? The What's at stake here is a lot different from what was at stake back in week two. It's all for the fans. Right, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Uh, we're going to get started here. We'll uh, move away from Carmel and Rita. We'll obviously get back to it later, but right now we have some big matchups. It's our two cents, the segment you all know and love. Uh, starting off with the first game here at Valenta Stadium. Uh, Chris, we've seen this matchup before. Yeah. Week 9, St. Francis versus Nazareth. Um, it'll be at Nazareth this time. The four seed versus the three seed, both teams at 10 and 2 on the season with their records there. This one a little bit earlier in the day, starting at one o'clock, uh, you know, the earliest you can for Saturday games. Christos, there's a whole lot going on here. St. Francis beat Loyola. Nazareth was the only team to win a state championship last year with those five losses. Obviously this year, a little bit different. I'd say they're doing a much better job with only two losses on the season. Um, they're looking to run it back again here in uh, you know their their specific class, respective class. They've got to get past the Spartans, though. So that's why I'm going to take them. I think in the postseason, you can't count Nazareth out. Chris, I know we might we might defer here a little bit. Yeah, you know, Matt, um, you look at that quarterback in Malachuk, that was probably uh, the most talented quarterback that we faced all season, I would say. Um, but I do have to go with the Spartans out of Wheaton, St. Francis. Um, I just think the talent that this team has had the momentum they've had going. They've had some really big wins, such as that win against Loyola and whatnot. They have all the confidence going in this game. And we've talked about it a few times, but it's so hard to beat the same team twice. Um, and y you mentioned this is a rematch from Week 9. I think St. Francis will pull out uh, late in the fourth quarter. It'll be a really gritty game, really close game, but I got the Spartans. Right. It's hard to think, but that Loyola-St. Francis game was a while ago. However, yeah. it still holds up to week 13 in which we're in now. Right. That game was played way back early on in the regular season. Loyola suffered that big loss, but now we can still learn a lot from it even here in the semifinal. So we're splitting paths there. This is gonna be a great game at one o'clock, right, you know, right in the middle of the day there on Saturday, coming up later on today. This is premiering right now. I gotta, I gotta remind myself yeah. about that. Uh, next one though, um, guys, you know, I, th I think you and I will agree here. Second game we've got today, we're heading back to a team we talk a, a lot about on this segment in particular. It's East St. Louis. They've got a home game as the one seed. They're 11 and one going up against Richards High School, the two seed, who's also 11 and one. Christos, I'm taking the Flyers, and I'd imagine you are too. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you, Matt. You know, I'd love to side with America's team and the Bulldogs. Um, they're having a spectacular season. I'm sure they got a lot of aces up their sleeves for this one, but uh, no one's going to bring down East St. Louis. Nah. I think they're going to dominate their way all the way through the state game, um, and they've represented us proudly, especially against a team like IMG, where they only lost by one point. Um, East St. Louis is one of the best teams in the nation. Right. So uh, I think it, that's kind of a no-brainer there. Yeah, I mean, you talk about East St. Louis losing to IMG, and I know 
IMG is technically having an off year, if you will. There's yeah. some stats flying around about them. They they haven't had this many losses in however many years. That doesn't matter. It's IMG Academy. They play a national schedule. They see teams like East St. Louis every year. This is just an average game for them. It was not an average game at all for East St. Louis. The Flyers still held their own. That is their one and only loss on the season. I think they're going to handle the Bulldogs very well. And honestly, Christos, <laughs> I've taken the ACT twice at Richards High School now, so I've just got bad vibes there. <laughs> so I think i got to go with East St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that loss actually helped them, I'd say, mm -hmm. in terms of rankings. So Right. Yeah. Right. Moving on, the next game, uh, a team we are extremely familiar with. Yeah, mm. another one here. Uh, we're heading out to Joliet Memorial Stadium. This time, kickoff will be at 2 o'clock. And uh, it's the JCA Hilltoppers. JCA, we met in week seven. Uh, we handled them pretty well for that Carmelite Classic game in honor of Mr. Hansen. was honestly one of, if not my favorite games this season so far. Just the energy behind it went beyond football a little bit. And uh, we dove a little bit more into, uh, you know, car that Carmelite school feel and why it's important. This one be, will be a little different from that. They're playing Morris High School, who, uh, you know, their football program, Hey, made it to the semis here, right? Yeah. Which they don't usually do. This is a chance for Morris to take down the Hilltoppers and head to a state championship, which is very unlike Morris. But it's also very unlike JCA to lose in the semifinals when they have a chance to go and get their 16th state championship in program history, just like Carmel will have a chance. We'll talk about that later, obviously. For all of those reasons, I'm taking the Hilltoppers. They're experienced. They're talented. They put up a great fight against MC in Week 7, which by far would have been a huge upset if they were able to win that game. I got to go with JCA here. Yeah, man, I totally agree. I think in terms of athletes, you know, they got a lot of dual and even triple sport athletes. Um, they're just full of uh, really gritty guys, which is kind of expected coming from another Carmelite school. Um, and I think they got all the momentum going. They want that 16th ring just as much as we do. I got the Hilltoppers. Absolutely. There's just so much history going on here. And you can't talk about history without talking about recent history, Christos. No. <coughs> the first thing that comes to mind, as far as opponents for recent history with Mount Carmel, it's not a Catholic League team, not a CCL Blue team. It's a public, it's a public school team, excuse me, from Batavia. Yeah. The Bulldogs from Batavia High School, the four seed in 7A, taking on Lincoln Way Central, the 24 seed. Um, Carmel plays the winner of this game. Or excuse me, the winner of Carmel versus Rita plays the winner of this game. And uh, it, we've got a lot of interesting outcomes here, I'd say, right? If uh, the Caravan went over the Mustangs and if the Bulldogs went over LWC here, um, that would be a state championship rematch from two years ago. It would be a playoff rematch for the fourth year in a row in which Mount Carmel has won the past three years. I'd say you and I are obviously not only rooting for this state championship rematch to happen because we want Carmel to be there, but we want Batavia to be there too, man. So I'm taking the Bulldogs, not only because I want them to be in the state championship game so we can hopefully meet them, but I truly do believe that Batavia has the better football team than Lincoln Way Central. Lincoln Way Central, though, I think they exceeded expectations this year. You see those three losses on their record. I think they were expected to have four or five at the end of the regular season. They cross that out. They've got nine total wins on the season now. Christos, this game will be at 5 o'clock uh, at Batavia. Yeah, Matt, I, th I think you're totally right. I'm going to take the Bulldogs as well with this one. Um, I think they've put up a really good resume for this year. Um, while it's maybe not been as dominant record-wise um, as in the past few years, I think they've done really good things. They played a team that we faced um, just recently in St. Charles North, and they killed them, yeah. right? So... You know, it's going to be a challenge if we can, you know, game by game. But if we can beat Rita, Batavia can win. That'd be a, a long-awaited rivalry matchup. Absolutely, yeah. Long-awaited is the best way to describe that. I'd say our next game, though, isn't so much long-awaited as it's kind of a guessing game here. I'd say this is, if not for that St. Francis and Nazareth game, this could be a really close one. Then obviously, it's the semifinals. You're going to have a lot of close games on here. Uh, the York Dukes taking on Naperville Central. This is kind of a throw up here. I think it's whoever wants it more. You got to throw experience out of the window a little bit here because as far as experience goes for these two teams, they've struggled with building a program, um, right? They're not as dominant as a Loyola or a Lincoln Way Central in 8A, which this game is for uh, a spot in the 8A state championship. Uh, York head coaching change, actually a lot of changes over the off season. Yeah. 
Naperville Central, I'd say, stayed pretty consistent, which is why they were able to only lose one game this year and find themselves with uh, the seven seed. York is the 14th. As far as seeding goes, I'm going to take an upset here with York, but I don't really think it's an upset at the end of the day. I think the Dukes have the better team. Yeah, I agree with you on this one, Matt. I think York's got a more experienced team. Um, they got a new coach who's a little gutsy in his play calling, um, but I think that's going to benefit them in the long run in this game. But, you know, I'm taking them at the same time. This game could go anyway. I think uh, this will be probably one of the better games, except for maybe the one we got next up. Yeah, I mean, this is the game of the year, if you will. You know, I think the 8A state championship, uh, when you look back in history, right, years from now, when you look back at 2024, as far as 8A goes, the state championship game will be overlooked for this semifinal matchup. And you know what? I think we got robbed a little bit of these guys not being on opposite sides of the bracket yeah. because if they were, I think they would have met in the state championship. But still, it's late in the playoffs, the latest it can be for these two teams to meet. And it's, you know, the Ramblers, we know them very well from that, that matchup week nine with the Caravan. Um, let's just say they handled that game with ease. They kind of ran past this a little bit, which is not what MC wanted to do. And it is certainly not what Lincoln Way East wants to do. Lincoln Way East is on a roll. They had a quarterback change. They had plenty of other specialty players come in and out. Um, whether it be transfers or guys just moving up to varsity, they have found the swing of things here in 2024. Undefeated. 12 and 0. In fact, the only undefeated team on here for our segment are two cents. Which, when you look at semifinal games, there's got to be a, you know at least a, a handful of teams yeah. there. But no, Lincoln East has defied the odds, defied the odds. Excuse me. And 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 what has been a very hectic season, I might say. Um, they've been able to stay at the top the entire time. I'm taking Lincoln East, man. <coughs> I think Loyola. They know their way around the playoffs. They especially know their way around semifinal and state championship games. But I think they're running out of steam here. I know they beat the Caravan in week nine you know, by a quite a large margin, but I think LW will pull out with the win here. This game, Saturday, it's 6 o'clock, so it'll be after the Caravan play the most things. Yeah, Matt, you look at Loyola's schedule, and they had a really shaky start to the season with losses to Brother Rice and St. Francis. Uh, and then they bounced back. They looked really strong. They it played very well against us here um, on a Friday night in an away game, which is, you know, uncommon for them, right? They're used to playing at those Saturday day games. Um, so they're able to adjust, and they played really well so far in the playoffs. They had a comeback win against Maris. They got all the momentum right now. But Lincoln Way East, I think, has the opportunity to take advantage of Loyola's off year, right? Yeah. This is, you know, two losses is uh, – uncommon for Loyola and this is probably their only shot because but come next year Loyola is going to be stacked again so I got Lincoln Way East I think it's going to be a shootout though um, it's going to be whichever offense can score the most points right I think I mean obviously but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That, it's yeah. That, that's the perfect way to look at yeah. it though because we saw a little bit of that last week when the caravan played normal that was absolutely a shootout in the first half yeah. Our defense wasn't able to stop the Ironmen. Eventually, they did a few times, but it was really our offense that took over. Yeah, a whole lot of touchdowns, especially Marshawn Thornton, yeah. kind of you know changing the momentum there early on in the second half. I think something else you have to take into account. You said it, Christos. Loyola and where they play, at what time, the weather. For some odd reason, maybe it's it's the way they play home games that seems to affect them a little bit more than other teams. This one is home at Lincoln Way East. It's going to be a cold Saturday night. I think that adds more to, you know, the Griffins' favor. I think the Ramblers might struggle with that a little bit. Coming off a bus in a semifinal game against a team that they beat last year in the state championship, they're going to think in their heads, this is a must-win game, and that will add a little bit more. I, you know, Lincoln Way East doesn't have nothing to lose, but they certainly have less than the Ramblers. So that's just – it adds a whirlwind of emotions and high stakes – but I do believe that the one seed Lincoln Way East Griffins will come out of this 8A semifinal game with a victory, and they'll make their way down to the state championship at Hancock Stadium. You talk about Hancock Stadium, folks. We're going to head to break pretty soon, but the Caravan and the Mustangs both have, a chance, both have a chance to do something incredible. The Mustangs lost to the Caravan week two, shut out 28 to nothing. They can come back and beat the Caravan, head down to Hancock Stadium, or the Caravan can do what is most favorited tonight for their game at uh, kickoff at 3 o'clock, folks. 
They can do what is most favorited and probably what is most probable and take down St. Rita. This would be their 69th win in program history between these two teams. Um, you know, they would then make their way again back down to the state championship, have a chance at that 16th ring and three in a row. We're getting ahead of ourselves here like I usually like to do. So when we come back from break, we're going to dissect uh, this team a little bit more and uh, we're going to talk about what it's going to take to take down the Mustangs. Men together, focused on a common goal. Aiming for excellence, grounded in faith. For 123 years and counting. Forming men for leadership. We are MC. Folks, welcome back here to the Alumni Gym, a historic landmark, if you will, at Mount Carmel High School. We figured it was pretty fitting to come in here. We came in here last week because yep. of how big of a playoff game it was. We're coming in here this week for a different reason, though. Grace tells us we've played St. Rita 104 times. We've got the upper hand on them, 68 wins, 33 losses, and three ties. We are obviously gunning for that 69th overall program win against the Mustangs. However, we're not really so much focused about that as we are. We're trying to repeat history here. Recent history, very recent history. I've said it multiple times. I'll say it again. Week two, we beat them 28 to nothing. I'll tell you right now, I don't think it's going to be like that again. Nope. No, not at all. We played the Mustangs two years ago in the semifinals, um, you know, late at night on a November, very chilly, windy, cold night. We were freezing by the end of the game at Doyle Stadium, and it really wasn't wasn't that big of a margin. Uh, you know, teams did not have that big of leads. It was close. Yeah. It was a whole lot of running by St. Rita as well as us. It's a battle of the defenses. Yes. Yeah, whichever defense played better, and then the long run, it was us. We had a couple interceptions and a pick six at the end of the game from Danny Novickis to seal the deal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even without that – last fourth quarter pick things might have gone a little differently definitely yeah um that cl that game ended close margin there folks and we're not even going to say it because you know how superstitious we get especially on the broadcast but um we don't want we don't want a repeat of that two years ago we want a repeat of what happened back in week two but that's only going to happen if these senior leaders and younger guys that have really stepped up um kind of take this moment right take it they shine in it they show up they show out so we're going to dissect this team a little bit and dive into our pregame stats slideshow. Folks, this game is played at is will be played at Doyle Stadium, excuse me, 3 o'clock kickoff. It's a Saturday semifinal showdown. Uh, only two weeks to go left in the season overall for the IHSA, but one of these teams will go home. Uh, the Caravan will either pick up their fourth loss or the Mustangs will finish their season 10-3. and three. And we've talked about it so much. 105th meeting between these two teams. Um, the Caravans only shut out this season, came against them. We've mentioned that a lot. But Coach Lynch, he's never lost to the Mustangs as a head coach. Pretty significant that it, that's never happened. Um, when you talk about a rivalry, you know what I'll say at Christos? This is feeling a little bit like uh, Bears-Packers right now. Coming from a Bears fan, though, I think I kind of know how St. Rita feels because there's been opportunities where they've had a tie game, a close game. Maybe they've been up even. But overall, um, all know, it comes down to is a 
blocked field goal sometimes. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. All it comes down to is, yeah, Jaden Bossy mm-hmm. coming out. But um, this will be a close one no matter what, folks. That's that's truly what I believe. A postseason game between these two rival teams, something's bound to happen. And if something is bound to happen, your offense has got to play pretty well. Christos, what have we got so far for the 2024 offensive stats? Well, just taking a look at our rushing yardage, this is actually very good this season. It's improved tremendously since week one. And you're looking at 180 rushing yards per game. Uh, DT has been our main man. He's averaging 57 per game. But then you also look at Madden Wilson. He stepped up big time in these last few weeks, as well as sophomore Nathan Samuels, who's been getting a lot more snaps in the playoffs. Then you look at our passing game, averaging just about 250 passing yards per game. Got 30 passing touchdowns. Jack Elliott is having... Just another phenomenal year, um, showing off why he's going to Vanderbilt. But, Matt, I want to take a look uh, at the rest of our offense. Yeah, uh, coming off of Elliott, he's got 25 passing touchdowns. Yep. But I think you and I both agree that th- the strongest part of his game, one, no, maybe not even one of, but uh, the, yeah, yeah. It's it's his legs, man. It's mm-hmm. how he can run the ball. Yeah, we see we saw that a lot with Coach Jordan Lynch. I know you and I uh, really weren't old enough to see all that magic happen, but uh, we're kind of seeing that repeat itself in a, in a way. Jack has a great arm, but when he runs the ball, man, he can lead this team to certain victories. I want to look at that St. Ignatius game, man. Those four rushing touchdowns blew the Wolf Pack out of the water, and yeah, Jack for that game, uh, you know. He kind of put the team on his back there for at least a little bit. Maybe not the entire game, but for a little bit for sure. He's got uh, 16 rushing touchdowns on the season. Overall, the team has 34. Um, Their offense is doing fantastic, though. 38 points per game. Our opponents only have 21.8. We have scored over 45 points in six games this season. Christos, though, uh, we're averaging, I think, at least um, you know 43 points per game in the playoffs, though, which... You got to take that into account. We're we're kind of going up from the regular season, which makes sense because we're playing teams that uh, aren't as competitive with us. But certainly, I think this game will be different. Saint Rita, uh, if last week was our first test with normal, this will certainly be our second. And you know, no test for on the gridiron comes without offense. If it does defense, defense, we've got to play great tomorrow. We've seen it happen two years ago. Defense, defense, defense. When we were at Doyle Stadium, it was cold. We had to stop their run game, and luckily we did. Christos, what have we got for the defense this year? Well, you look at the sack totals with 17 sacks for 116 yards. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Matt Muha, the linebacker, is actually leading the team uh, as he has been all season. He's got five sacks, followed closely by his other linebacker, Roman Iguabike, uh, Joey Quinn, Brandon Jones, Tristan Pusateri. Tucker and Cronin also got in there for a piece. Um, the D-line, I think that's been the key, especially in the second half, is when they start applying more pressure on the quarterback. And we've seen it all year. When the sack total goes up, the margin of victory also goes up, Matt. So I think that's the key for this game coming up. Uh, then you also look at 52 total tackles for loss for 258 yards. Uh, Muha is also leading that one with 12 and a half tackles. And he's leading the whole team in tackles with 91 um, so he just he's won under his uh, season total last year, so he'll break that record this year. Matt, how about our PBUs, though, and interceptions? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, you just kind of told us about our interior defense. I think our exterior has struggled a little bit this year. Yeah. Our secondary has needed some work. However, you see there are 44 total PBUs. Tavares Duty Harrington has nine of them. Yeah. Uh, he stepped up. He's a younger guy, sophomore, really taking account there. Um, these seniors, I think they're showing him the way, but at the same time, he's proving himself, definitely. He's one of the best guys we've got there for our DBs. Uh, Ten interceptions for 99 yards. Javi Payne has four of them for 47 of those yards. So not only is Javi finding the right place to intercept the ball, he can run it back for a while. Oh, yeah. He can run it back for a while. I feel like every time Javi gets a pick, he's always on the move right away. He never shies away from just running it straight back to an O-lineman or, or some receiver in his way. Uh, you know, he's never going to run out of bounds or anything like that. If the ball's in his hands on the field, he's lowering that shoulder, n- you know, never going out without a fight. I'd say most DBs are like that this year. The only thing we've struggled with is just – kind of having glue guys maybe. On the D-line, we certainly have some guys there that can bring the team together with our secondary and our DBs, though. This is really everybody's first time playing with one another. It's not your average, all right, you know, 
you, we have a group of juniors, and then when they become seniors, they're all going to start. Didn't really happen this year. We had to bring in young guys who have, on paper, been incredible. But, you know, you can't write stats about how well you get with one of your other guys. You can't write stats about, you know, just kind of that uh, third eye you need to have when you're dropping back in deep coverage. So overall, they've played great. I think letting up 42 points last week to normal, um, it was more than we expected, more than we thought. And we're definitely going to try to keep the Mustangs to uh, not not quite that amount of, uh, of production on offense. Here we go, Christos. These are our guys of the year, though. Uh, you know, these three guys you see here, I think, are the three MVPs, absolutely. Um, you can make arguments for other guys, but you can't argue against these guys. So, Christos, I'll let you start, man. Pick one of the three. There's a lot to talk about with all of them. Yeah, I'll start with the defense here, going with uh, number 41, Matt Muha. That's pretty self-explanatory. He's the best defensive player we've had um, in the past couple of years here. But 91 total tackles, 33 solo, 12 and a half sacks uh, for 50 yards. I believe that's tackles for loss, 12 mm -hmm. and a half tackles for loss, and five sacks, right? He's a captain, starting inside linebacker. He had 92 tackles last year. Um, he's creeping in that top 10 all time for tackles, and he's just a leader out there. You can tell, you can hear him. He's the most vocal guy on the field. Um, that one explains itself. How about you going on, Matt? <laughs> you know, I'll go to the other side of the ball, man. And uh, I won't do the senior quarterback. I'll do the other guy okay. who plays for the offense. Senior number 27, Xander Gorman. Christos, you wrote an article about this guy at the start of the season for the school newspaper. Go check it out, the MC Caravan. Um, Thank but you. Yeah, of course. Uh, starting tight end primarily, also plays some defense as well. Bounces between the two, of course. So uh, you you got to, you know, there are some guys out there that are listed that play both ways. Xander truly does that, though. Xander truly does that. He's got 59 total tackles, uh, two of those for a loss, and 23 solo on the year. But that article, Christos, that you wrote about wasn't so much about Xander as it was really encapsulating the meaning of what it is to wear number 27 out there on the field for caravan football, starting by uh, Mr. Bill Nolan, who <laughs> still works here, you know, yep. uh, starting by him back in the 80s. Now it's just continued well on into, uh, it's become a, a part of Mount Carmel football history, and so has Xander Gorman. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, we'll take a look at another obvious choice on the offensive end, that's senior quarterback Jack Elliott. Uh, this year he's got just over 2,700 passing yards. He's actually... Uh, just over 400 passing yards away from breaking his own record from last year uh, that he set. He had about 31, uh, 3,180 passing yards in a season. That's the most in Mount Carmel history. But he's looking to break that maybe even this game if he has a big game just mm -hmm. like he did last week. Um, 25 passing touchdowns. The rushing, though, as you talked about earlier, might even be the strongest part of his game. He's got 16 rushing touchdowns, 600 rushing yards. Um, that's pretty much the stats speak for themselves here. Yeah, and I'd say we didn't even really get to the tip of the iceberg with these guys. We no. just started chipping away at the top. For all three of these guys, there's plenty of stories around them. All four of them have been here for all four years. None of them have transferred in, which I think makes an even bigger argument for why they are truly the right. MVPs for their senior year. Let's go uh, a little bit different here, Chris. Those, um, we talked about the guys that have been here for a while and why they're really senior leaders. This is kind of the complete opposite. These are our rookies of the year, the most valuable underclassmen. I'll start with the oldest guy out of this bunch. <laughs> it's sophomore wide receiver number four, Quentin Burrell. Um, got that record, which we'll talk about in a second, a uh, little bit over 1,100 receiving yards, 17 per catch, which if you look above that at Marshawn Thornton, we'll get to that later <laughs> too. Um, obviously, though, incredible. 99 receiving yards per game. 13 receiving touchdowns. He's really fill, filled the shoes of guys that have played last year. Um, Christos, the w the one position room that has changed the most over the offseason, I think by far, is the wide receiver room. We've got a new receivers coach with Landon Cox. We have kept some guys like Jake Cozy and Allie McCoy, but Cooper Lehman, Marshawn Thornton, and Quentin Burrell have absolutely changed the dynamic of being a Mount Carmel receiver. Uh, I think Elliot probably was not so much worried, but he was probably just questioning, like, who am I going to throw the ball to, you know, this season? Luckily, these guys came in. Quentin played here at Carmel last year. Now uh, he's a sophomore making his mark on varsity. When you talk about making your mark on varsity, being pulled up as a freshman is something that really doesn't happen at all. It's never talked about. These two guys above did, though, Christos. 
Yeah, I'll start staying on the offensive side of things here with the basketball player, converted football, Marshawn Thornton. Uh, actually came here for basketball, but he turns out he's a pretty good dual sport athlete. Uh, number 80, he's got just under 500 receiving yards. He's averaging 24.1 yards per catch. Uh, if you look in the history books, Matt, that is a Mount Carmel record once again. I uh, mean the, the next closest <laughs> guy is averaging 22 yards per catch in a season. So as a freshman, to be breaking records is uh, just unbelievable. But um, right, averaging 70 yards per game. He's got four receiving touchdowns. I don't think I've ever seen him this season have a, a quick pa a quick pass. I think every single reception he's had, it just seems like it's some Hail Mary or something going Definitely. down the field to the end zone. Um, that's pretty much all you can say about Marshawn, though. But, Matt, I think you got a couple words about the other freshman, Caleb Tucker. Absolutely. Uh, Caleb Tucker, freshman D-line, and he's played in all 12 games. I just want to say those stats for Marshawn are through seven games. All right, he got pulled up a little right. bit later. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> Christos, the stats you just talked about, 24.1 yards per catch, and he's played seven games this year instead of the entire season. That makes it even more important for that history book we've got. However, Caleb Tucker, however, is a huge part of this caravan defense. Now, we talk about the D-line. These are the glue guys of this defense, that interior defense. You've got Matt Muha at linebacker, as well as Roman Ikubike. Unfortunately, got injured last week. We're going to have to see what happens here throughout the rest of his sophomore year. But Caleb Tucker, still pretty healthy. You know, number 79, everybody's banged up. And uh, he's still going to play here on Saturday. So we're really excited for him. 22 total tackles, three of them being solo. He's got three and a half of those for a loss and one forced fumble. Uh, like I said, played in all 12 games. He is the only freshman to do that in school history, which is, <laughs> I mean, it, it's hard to say about these rookies of the year, but I, I think they're going to be, right, th the slide we just talked about before, the leaders of the year, look out for these three guys. They might be that in a couple of years. Moving on, though, one guy we absolutely want to spotlight is somebody uh, I think I've failed to talk about enough this season, man, but he had a great game last year, and I knew for sure right away we've got to give him his flowers, man. So uh, senior year stats for the sack master, Tristan Pusateri. He's you know an outside linebacker, number 28, has been last year, came back this year, and he's had a remarkable season. I think stats-wise, blew last year's stats out of the water, which was hard to do because of how good they are. Um, but he's having a great year. Christos, what do you got to say about Tristan, man? Yeah, you look at it, he's got 47 total tackles, and uh, that's coming in. Those are mainly in the backfield. I feel like, you know, he's got uh, 22 solo, but two sacks, an interception, five PBUs. The thing I want to look at, though, is uh, specifically last week's game in which he had eight tackles, two PBUs. Um, he was applying pressure on the quarterback. He stopped a lot of big throws, too. You talk about those two PBUs. They were both... Um, actually right up on the quarterback where he just kind of deflected it right away, um, and they would have been some pretty big plays that could have resulted in scores. So he, I think he was probably the player of the game last week, Matt, if we had to pick one um, against normal. Right, definitely. Um, two weeks ago against St. Charles North, you and I kept on kind of saying in the booth, like, Tristan is just always there. Yeah. You know, there were a couple of passes there um, for the North Stars where they got tipped or the throw was off by not even a couple feet, but it was just completely out of the way of the receiver. That was Tristan just blitzing right up the gap, maybe, you know, around the line, whatever he had to do to get to the quarterback. He better keep doing it the rest of the season yeah. because it has been working here in the playoffs. Moving on, though, Christos, we've got something we need to look at. Yeah, Matt, uh, you know, we were talking about a lot of records being broken with uh, guys like Marchand, but let's take a look at Q. Quentin Burrell, it's his first year on varsity, and he broke the <laughs> receiving yard record uh, for a single season already. He's got 1,188 yards. He broke the record by more than 100 yards, um, and he's going to keep pushing, right? And he's second all-time in receiving yards at Caravan history right now, just below... Uh, Danny Furlong, so I'm sure he's you know he's got two more years to go. I'm excited to see what happens with that. But another thing I want to point out that I didn't even put on here is Cooper Lehman is actually on set to be second uh, all time for receiving yards in the season as well. So you got two new receivers this year that are just totally changing what it means to play football for Mount Carmel. And Christos, what I gotta follow it up with is the past three or so years that you and I have been announcing. 
I, I think the most memorable guys besides Dupree and Blaney, it's been those receivers, man. Oh, right? yeah. There's been a couple guys on defense, too, but Jimmy Dacey, Denny Furlong, Darion Gilliam, there's definitely guys that come to mind immediately where, like, oh, those were your go-to guys if you wanted to pass. And I thought heading into this year, there's no way you can top that. There's no <laughs> way you can top that. Yeah. And we somehow did. I don't know how, but these guys came to 64-10, and they're, they're having a season for sure. Moving on, though, you talk about having a season. No season is complete without the playoffs. The Caravans so far are 3-0 and in this year's postseason. Uh, stayed in 7A this year. They've been in 7A for quite some time. They have those two back-to-back -back state championships. Trying to make it three in a row here, Christos. First, they've got to get through Rita, and then uh, they will either, you know, they'll move on to the state championship, hopefully, there at ISU. These next two games here will be on Saturdays, uh, right around, you know, 3, 4 o'clock kickoff, so... This is where this is where playoff football becomes playoff football. We have to have to have to kind of roll through St. Rita. I feel like this is a game where we gotta dominate. I know that there's definitely definitely a high chance that we don't. There's definitely a high chance this is a close, gritty matchup, which would obviously, for a fan, I'd love to see that. But um, at the same time, we gotta be prepared for it. You know, if we want to go get that 16th ring, head down to Hancock Stadium and uh, win for three years in a row. This pregame show is presented to you by members of CMG. Thank you, thank you, thank you to moderators, Miss Eleanor Menke and Mr. Tony DiFilippo, graduating in 92. And sad to say, we'll bring you Peg here to the desk for just a short moment, but um, we're about to graduate, man. This is most likely our last football pregame show. Maybe. Thanks, brother. Of course. Thank you. Know, you. This, uh, this season was incredible, remarkable. Eight broadcasts for you, know, you yeah. and I. Leonard back there as well, um, as you saw on the slide there. And we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the show. But first, I want to look at some stats. We have um, a little under 100,000 views. <laughs> We're averaging 5,000 views per stream, which is incredible. Some of these games, obviously, uh, blew our expectations. So thank you for tuning into our broadcasts. Also, thank you tuning into our podcasts, which um, we kind of started back in the spring. And we have continued those now into the fall and we will continue uh, continue to record them in the winter and spring of this year. We've got 19 uh, episodes and a new one recently came out earlier this week for Shoulder to Shoulder. If you're looking for something to watch before today's game at three o'clock, head on over. Uh, the Damon brothers, Bryce and Bishop, kind of looked at the, this game between St. Rita and uh, we're, we're all excited here at Carmel. We'll finally bring you back to the desk one more time. I'm making Leonard work here. Uh, right at the end of it, but folks, thank you for tuning in on this Saturday morning with us. Um, we hope to see you there at the game. Christos and I will be on the sideline giving you updates on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. We'll be taking pictures. We'll be, we'll be doing our media stuff while the football guys yep. are doing their football stuff. So right now, signing off from the alumni gym. Have a great day, and good luck, Caravan. Have a great day, Chicago. So long. <laughs>